Buenas tardes, primera llamada. Ya estamos a punto de comenzar, primera llamada. No se escucha un ca... Buenas tardes, a punto de comenzar, primera llamada. Vamos a comenzar los trabajos de la tarde. ¿Alguien está bien contenta? Están gozando, qué bueno, y no hemos empezado. Bueno, buenas noches. Good night, good evening. Uh, yo soy Norma Peña eh, eh, Rivera, directora de la Escuela Graduada de Planificación de aquí del recinto de Río Piedras. Eh, vamos al comienzo de la conferencia. 
la demencia de la razón económica, Marx y la posibilidad de un humanismo radical. Eh, esto ha sido una colaboración, una iniciativa entre la escuela y sobre todo el grupo eh, colectivo Junte Gente y Pares. Eh, y en esa línea, nos, no, ya que nos encontramos en el anfiteatro de la Facultad de Estudios Generales, eh, queremos antes que nada rendir un tributo a un gran ser humano que además eh, fue un gran escritor y poeta, eh, con, eh, comprometido con las mejores causas y profesor de esta facultad. En honor a Carlos Alberti Fragoso, queremos guardar un, un aplauso. Por supuesto. Así que agradecemos a la Facultad de Estudios Generales, eh, a, el señor Alberti también fue parte del, del grupo Pares eh, que trabajó con esta iniciativa. Agradecemos también a los eh, eh, colaboradores de la escuela. Eh, como les digo, es, es muy un honor y un placer que ustedes estén aquí con nosotros esta noche. Y para dar comienzo, eh, un poco de reflexión en los tiempos donde la acumulación de la riqueza a toda costa el bienestar individual y la competencia son parte de la cultura dominante, donde los recortes astronómicos en los servicios sociales y servicios esenciales como la educación en todos sus niveles, la salud y la protección ambiental son la orden del día. Es no solo necesario, sino urgente pensar y reflexionar sobre las causas de tanta violenta, violencia estructural. En vez de planificar para la democracia y la justicia social, nos planifican un futuro de escasez y destrucción ambiental, de espacios y lugares privados, sin participación ciudadana. Para poder actuar de manera efectiva e incontundente, es importante entender, mirar más allá de las explicaciones oficiales y los medios de comunicación, y echar mano de la teoría crítica para usando otros lentes, Poder mirar la realidad críticamente, por supuesto, para actuar. Y la universidad debe ser ese epicentro donde debates como este de ideas y de reflexión crítica debe ocurrir. Y por eso es que estamos aquí esta noche. Nuestro invitado es uno de los pensadores más importantes en el mundo que ha señalado las contradicciones del capitalismo y de la razón económica. Es tal vez la persona que más ha contribuido en demostrar la importancia que tiene el trabajo de Carlos Marx para entender cómo funciona el capitalismo contemporáneo dentro del cual todos vivimos. Su trabajo ha influido en múltiples disciplinas como la geografía, la sociología, la antropología, la economía política, los estudios urbanos y la planificación. Además, sus análisis sobre las ciudades y el proceso de urbanización son fundamentales para entender las formas en que el capital crea nuevas condiciones de injusticia social y a la vez cómo las ciudades también pueden ser espacios de esperanza, democracia y justicia social. Su obra de más de 20 libros e innumerables artículos académicos es un testimonio de rigor intelectual y reflexión teórica. Lecturas obligadas en todo programa graduado que reconozca la importancia del pensamiento crítico y una práctica basada en el bien común. Es profesor de Geografía y Antropología en el Centro Graduado de la Universidad de Nueva York, CUNY. Hoy también tendremos, eh, comentando la presentación magistral de David Harvey, al doctor Gustavo García López, quien es experto en política pública ambiental y estudia las relaciones entre los grupos humanos y el ambiente a través de los lentes de la ecología política y la teoría institucional. Su interés en los comunes, los espacios, recursos y ecosistemas que se viven y comparten en común y su relación a las luchas socioambientales ha resultado en la publicación de varios artículos académicos en revistas internacionales. 
Y desde el 2015, el doctor García es profesor miembro de la Facultad de la Escuela Graduada de Planificación. Es un privilegio y un honor de parte de la Escuela Graduada de Planificación de la Universidad de Puerto Rico. El rector iba a estar con nosotros, se excusa, pues presidencia lo llamó de la última hora. Eh, ustedes saben que hay muchas cosas pasando y hay que resolverla o tratar. Así es que muchas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, David Hervey, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Maybe I should speak in Spanish so they translate. <laughs> David Harvey, it's your turn. Well, I want to thank uh, everybody who's made this uh, meeting possible. It uh, did seem to me, uh, since I've been doing some work uh, over the last few years in Greece, uh, where there is a similar crisis of uh, indebtedness and austerity and terrible, terrible things happening, that uh, uh, one should pay attention also to uh, terrible things that have been happening here in uh, Puerto Rico and that uh, I wanted to take this occasion to express some solidarity with uh, my colleagues in this university which is obviously uh, under threat and under attack uh, and I think that we should do everything we can uh, to try to defend it and I hope that uh, meetings of this kind can contribute to, uh, to that kind of politics. I tend these days when I'm trying to uh, talk about uh, how to understand the world to go back to a very simple formulation uh, which is not the one you see on the screen. This is the one uh, that I tend to use in order to uh, seduce geography students into realizing that you can actually represent capital uh, in rather the same way that you can Uh, represent the water cycle, but what I'm really into is the, if I can figure out, can you figure out how the next one comes up? Okay. Yeah. This is, a, this is a map of what it is that Marx is doing in the three volumes of Capital. <laughs> uh, it's not actually that complicated. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that Marx in the, th in the three volumes of Capital was writing a theory of capital, not a theory of capitalism. And the theory of capital is about how capital produces and reproduces its own conditions of existence. And it's a particular kind of capital that Marx is looking at. He's looking at uh, industrial capital, not merchant capital or rentier capital or anything, just he's mainly looking at industrial capital. And he looks at it as a continuous flow in the production and reproduction of value. And if you start on this diagram right at the bottom there with money capital, what does an, a, a manufacturing capitalist do? Uh, they take some money, uh, and not all money is capital. Uh, they take some money and they turn it into money capital, which is money which is going to be used to make more money. And there's a very specific way in which the more money is going to be made. The money is used by the capitalist to purchase two commodities, means of production, which is the raw materials, the semi-manufactured products, the machinery and, everything, and the energy and all the rest of it, and also the labor power. Having purchased those two commodities, those two commodities are put to work in a labor process, which is the first red box in the diagram. And that labor process is about the creation of value and surplus value in the form of another commodity. That commodity, once it is ready, is taken into the market. And that takes us to the second red box, which is the box of realization of value. Now, there's a big distinction to be drawn between the production of value and the realization of value. 
I have a fight with a lot of Marxists who think about production but don't want to discuss realization. In Marx's analysis, as I see it, he's arguing that you cannot understand capital without understanding what he calls the contradictory unity between production and realization. In other words, if you produce something and you can't realize it, then it's no value. So the second step then is the realization of value. And that realization of value takes value from the commodity form back into the monetary form. So you have money. That money is then distributed in various forms, wages, and wages are being going to be spent on certain commodities which capital produces. Those wages, when, uh, when spent, are then filtered back round into processes of social reproduction. And those social processes of social reproduction make sure that the laborer is there the next day in order to come back into work. So there is a circuit there, if you like, of movement of wages back into the purchase of commodities through social reproduction and back into uh, the circulation process. Some of it is distributed, of course, in the form of taxes, which go to the state. Some of it is distributed as profit to merchant capital. Some of it is distributed to the ba bankers and financiers and to the landlords and to the industrial capitalist. Some of that is then spent on, on consumer goods, but some of it is also recapitalized by flying back into production as reinvestment. This is the basic circulation process that Marx is going to look at throughout the three volumes of Capital. And it's interesting to note that the first volume of Capital concentrates on the first red box, production. The second volume of Capital deals uh, with the circulation process and the realization process. The third volume of capital deals with distribution. And my point immediately to people here is if you want to understand Marx's theory of capital, you have to understand the relations between the three volumes of capital. Now, volume one of capital is very much read. Uh, volume two is not read very much at all. And volume three is confusing and people don't know quite what to make of it. So it does seem to me that there's an important uh, job to be done of clarifying what some of the relationships are between the three volumes of capital, and that's the sort of work which I have been engaged upon. All of this activity, this circulation process, this flow of value which goes through these different forms, Marx insists that the continuity of the process is vital. If at any point the flow stops, then you have a crisis. So there's going to be a problem of crisis formation at any point within this system. So if you want to block capital, you can block it anywhere, not just at the point of production. It can be blocked. The other thing that Marx does is to say there are contextual conditions which are terribly important for this circulation process to operate. The first set of contextual conditions is really listed at the bottom of the screen. Marx talks frequently about the significance of the metabolic relation to nature. And therefore, as he says, there are free gifts of nature which flow into the system and upon which industrial capital relies. Uh, the free gifts of uh, energy and power, the free gifts of minerals and resources, agricultural capacity and all the rest of it. So the relation to nature is terribly important, but Marx also introduces the category of what he calls second nature. So he's not only looking at the environment, he's looking at the built environment as well. And when we look at this, we see that capital is trying to construct an environment for itself, a built environment for itself, which is going to be sufficient unto its requirements for social reproduction. And this relation, metabolic relation to nature is something that Marx mentions many times, but says almost invariably when he does so that I can't deal with that here. Now, because Marx says I can't deal with that here, that does not mean that Marx thinks it's unimportant. It says for purposes of analysis, I am not going to go deeply into the question of the relation to nature. I'm not going to go deeply into the question of the creation of built environments and what happens and all the rest of it. I'm going to leave that for somebody else to do. That somebody else in this case was in part me. 
So what I've spent a lot of time doing is, of course, talking about the formation of built environments, how built environments relate to the circulation of capital, uh, what goes on in terms of that, uh, that area of uh, uh, productive activity, and how the relation with capital accumulation and the dynamic relation, how important it is, and I'll be getting around to that in a, in a, shortly. The second thing that is uh, contextual is what might be called the free gifts of human nature, which has a lot to do with the way in which capital trades upon cultural heritages, depends upon the intelligence of the worker, depends upon uh, all sorts of uh, aspects, not only uh, in, the, in the production process, but also in the world of consumption because the realization of value in the market depends upon there being wants, needs, and desires for the commodities that have been produced. And so there's a long history of capital trying to reshape wants, needs, and desires in such a way as to create the market which it requires to survive. And if it cannot recreate wants, needs, and desires, uh, it will be in deep uh, trouble. So there's a whole kind of cultural history, cultural formation, but in this, what, the creation of wants, needs, and desires are simply not about the blandishments of the, uh, uh, of, of the advertising industry and all the rest of it. It's about the creation of a way of life. The, the creation of a way of life that makes certain market moves absolutely necessary. Uh, 30 years ago, if uh, I had said to you, we will all be milling around with cell phones and doing this all the time, people would look at you as if I was mad. But the point is that capital has created a world in which we all have to have cell phones, whether we like it or not. And this is the, the point about the creation of ways of life. There was a creation of a way of life after World War II, which is called suburbanization. People didn't have an option. You had to buy a car. You had to you know, have many of the things that were necessary for a suburban way of life uh, to exist. So the point here is that there is a cultural world which is in constant transformation. It's not dictated by capital, but there's a constant movement, if you like, of influences between capital and how capital appropriates culture, how culture tries to escape capital. There's a long history in all of this in the same way that there's a long history of how trying to create built environments which suit capital goes against built environments which are meaningful uh, for a population and a relation to nature which is meaningful. Now the reason these contextual conditions are important is because if we want to sort of situate Marx's analysis better, we will be very alert uh, to these sorts of relationships between uh, cultural transformations and environmental transformations and we will try actually to uh, work on that and at the same time uh, there is also the question of social reproduction. Marx talks about social reproduction periodically but doesn't go very far into it. He just says okay I'm going to leave that for other people to look at and I'm going to leave that for the working class to sort it out uh, as far as my theoretical uh, perspective is concerned. It was therefore, thereby assumed that Marx didn't actually think social reproduction was important. He did, he thought it was very important, he just wasn't going to deal with it, and it's taken uh, three de decades of feminists to persuade us that we should actually take social reproduction seriously and analyze it in great detail and configure it. But one of the things that bothers me when, when, when this sort of thing happens is there's a tendency to say, well, if I want to look at the relation to nature, I have to forget about that relation to capital. That's a stupid thing to do. I would say the same about if you analyze social reproduction and you kind of imagine you can imagine it without actually looking at the relation to capital, again, that's a stupid thing to do. In other words, the totality here is what matters. And when you start to think about the totality, you're constantly looking at the ways in which these elements relate to each other. And at the same time, we're recognizing that the continuity of this process, the dynamics of this process, are absolutely critical uh, for the sustaining of a capitalist society. So that you start to look at that core circulation process and you say the continuity of it has to be there. Anything that interrupts it is a crisis. Also, it's not only 
a cyclical process as portrayed here, it's actually operating as a spiral. That is, it's growing. And it has to grow because it creates profit, and profit is created through surplus value, which means there's more value at the end of the day than there was at the beginning. Part of that value has to be reincorporated back into the dynamics of the system. Therefore, the system is perpetually growing. So it is spiral form. And it creates various barriers to itself. And the barriers are actually terribly important and because uh, they are marks and, and points of, uh, of contestation. One other point I want to make, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, I'll leave you to, to work this out, is that every one of these points creates its own kind of form of, of anti-capitalist struggle. And there's a tendency within the Marxist literature to think there's only one kind of anti-capitalist struggle that matters, and that's the struggle over production. And that therefore it's the labor process which is the center of struggle. And that's where the class relation between capital and labor is reproduced, and that's where it is challenged, and therefore that is a vital, the vital center of what class struggle is all about. My argument would be no. That form of struggle is terribly important, but so is the struggle over realization. If you can't realize value, then no good. If the conditions of, of realization are appalling, there's gonna be class struggle uh, over realization. One of the big struggles in the United States these days is over pharmaceutical uh, prices which has everything to do with the conditions of realization. The pharmaceutical companies are extracting and appropriating value that they have not created through monopoly power in the market. There is a huge struggle being waged over that question. But that struggle, it does not have the same social character as the struggle over the class relations that exist in production. In fact, all realization struggles are actually struggles between buyers and sellers. And the buyers and the sellers are not necessarily capitalists and laborers. In other words, the pharmaceutical question is big capital actually not being very nice to the rest of capital and, and, and to, to all members of different classes, everybody who purchases pharmaceutical products. And the result is that the anti-capitalist struggle has a very different form when it's in the field of realization. And we have to understand that. And we have at the same time to understand how that relates to the dynamics of capital accumulation. And the same thing applies to every one of the configurations here. For example, my friend here works in socio-ecological analysis. Well, you're down in the bottom right-hand corner. Now, if I'm up in the left-hand corner, I don't say, you're an idiot for working down there. No, you say, look, you're, what you're working on down there is something terribly, terribly important. It's a piece of the thing, but this, the kind of relations and fights you're going to have over socio-ecological questions are very, very different from those that occur in, say, the realm of social reproduction. And the ones that occur in the realm of social reproduction have a very different character to the cultural struggles that exist. But they are all part of anti-capitalist struggles. And that therefore, we have to think about the relations between these different, different forms of struggle and recognize them for what they are and recognize their distinctive character, acknowledge that distinctive character and not tell somebody, oh, you don't know what you're talking about because you haven't got the right conception of class. You say, we are, what you're doing is very important and I can see how it is actually uh, about trying to struggle against this monstrous system of expansion, of perpetual capitalist accumulation, and it, the monstrous way in which it is producing social inequality and environmental degradation and all the rest of it, and we have to look at the totality and see how to put all those different struggles together. This seems to me to be the big challenge of, of, of our times because you will see many different struggles. For instance, in, in Brazil in, in, in uh, 2013, it, it, was, it was transport that was the beginnings of the, of, of the, of the struggle. Now, who's affected by, by transport, you know? And, well, a lot of it was the student movement. So, so we don't, the reason I like this kind of framework is it, it, it situates social movements, it situates struggles, it situates kind of a question of what anti-capitalist politics might be about. 
And this, to me, is a very important way in which also to put together the understanding that comes from the three volumes of capital. Because the three volumes of capital, as I've suggested, deal with, one, deal with parts of this. Volume one of capital assumes there's absolutely no problem volume two and volume three. You can read volume one of capital and not, not find the landlord mentioned except at the very end. You won't find the credit system barely crops up, just a couple of times mentioned. You'll find there's nothing about the distribution relationship apart from the wage rate. It does concentrate on that. Marx doesn't, in volume one of Capital, ever talk about taxes. In fact, in the three volumes of Capital, he tends to leave taxes to one side for the simple reason that if you look at the plans he had for Capital, he was going to write a separate book about the state and taxation, but he never got round to it. We have to add that in if we want. So with that in mind, I want to take up a very, very peculiar feature about the dynamics of this system and, and what it's about. I've mentioned it's about growth. It's about compound growth, and it's about managing the system in certain kinds of ways. And as the crisis of 2008 unfolded, so there were a series of maneuvers made to try to rescue capital from the blockages that it was suffering from. The credit system had, in effect, collapsed. There's a little kind of arrow in there where I insert something called the circulation of interest-bearing capital. This is a big, big problem for the system, and, and it's something which I'm going to get round to just a little, little, little shortly. But, in effect, the credit system froze. How was it going to be unblocked? Well, where was the power to unblock it? The answer lies in that area of distribution where state and finance rests. And there is something there which I call the state finance nexus, which has a long history of intervening in the dynamics of this system. And if there's any control within this system, it lies within this state finance nexus. And what they decided in the state finance nexus was that they were going to flood this system with liquidity. They were going to pour money into this whole thing, get as much money as possible. And one of the ways they did it was by something called quantitative easing. And quantitative easing had the central banks, like the Federal Reserve, purchase mortgages, bonds, and all the rest of it, and take them out of the market and replace them with free-flowing money. And then the theory was the free-flowing money, once it gets in there, will lubricate everything, it will start flowing around, everything will be okay. Didn't really happen. What really happened was the free-flowing money went to the banks, and the banks simply used the money to recapitalize themselves and forgot to give it into the system. So the system was still gumming up. Some of it went out into the stock market, and some of it went in various other ways. In fact, a lot of that money, as far as we could tell, ended up not lubricating the whole system, but flowing into the pockets of the most affluent groups in society. So we see uh, again and again and again around the world that since 2008, the top 1% has actually increased its wealth and power by a factor of, I don't know, 10, 15%, whereas everybody else has either lost or it's remained stagnant. So in other words, quantitative easing, as far as I was concerned, and as far as actually even the public perception and even, you know, uh, you know e e even Theresa May in, in Britain kind of uh, uh, acknowledged, probably, probably increased inequality. So the Bank of England set up a big research operation to see if that was indeed the case. And they produced a huge report on what the impact of, was of quantitative easing on the distribution of income. And the result they came to was this, that the, top, the bottom 10% in Britain over a six-year period gained 3,000 pounds. The top 10% gained 325,000 pounds. Now, I looked at that, 3,000 pounds for the bottom 10%, 325,000 for the top one, you know, 10%. That says to me that this is actually increasing inequality. But actually, the bank's answer was, no, it did not. 
Actually, the whole headline in the Financial Times reported on this says, quantitative easing decreased inequality. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, the answer was that the incomes of the bottom 10% were so low that 3,000 pounds over 10 years gave them a much better percentage boost relative to the 325,000 for the top 10% who had so much money that it was pretty trivial to them. Now, what, would you, what position would you rather be in? Would you rather hold $100 and be offered a 10% rate of return or $1 million and have a 5% rate of return? <laughs> now, this is important because it says, what's more important, the rate or the mass? And this is something that's very interesting because the bank was very concerned about this public perception that quantitative easing had not, you know, had uh, increased inequality. It was very concerned about that, and they were very delighted that they had shown this was not the case. But yet it, it, was, yet it was the case. So they then said, well, the trouble is when the public doesn't know how to read economic statistics properly. If they understood that the rate of change on the, the least wealthy was, you know, much higher than the rate of change for the, for the top, then, then people would really appreciate quantitative easing and would welcome it. But then you think of it and you say, 3,000 pounds over six years, it actually that ends, ends up to about one pound a week extra. It's so trivial for the, top, the bottom 10%. Does it increase their wealth and power and influence in society? No, not at all. On the other hand, for the very ultra-rich, the 325,000 pounds also probably seemed trivial, but at least it was going to give them, you know, maybe 110 pounds a week extra. And after six years of that, they could have enough money to sort of contribute to Donald Trump, Trump's re-election campaign or whatever. And it's a significant form of power, and, and, and so here is this. And what's interesting is, when you start to read what the economists and how the economists formulate things in the world, it's always about rates of growth. In fact, you know, we start to define a crisis with zero rate of growth. And, and it's therefore about rates and rates of growth, and nobody pays any attention to the mass. And what the mass is about, and what the mass means. And the result is that actually almost all public discourse, I mean, people talk about, can we raise the rate of growth, the, gro the GDP growth rate, growth of productivity, growth of this, growth of that, growth of that, is all expressed in rates never in terms of the absolute mass. But in that case I've just mentioned, the absolute mass became significant. And it actually, about this time this report came out, there was another article in the Financial Times which kind of said, you know, there's a real big problem in global stock markets right now because everybody's anticipating a bit of a depression, and this is towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And one of the reasons was the growth rate in China had come down real fast. And with a sort of low growth rate in China, everybody kind of said, well, you know, that signals a bad, bad possibility. The problem was the Chinese seemed to be not be bothered by the fact that the growth had come down. And somebody went and sort of asked some questions, and they found out the following answer. That, oh, China needs to create something like 10 million jobs a year. How can it create 10 million jobs a year? And the point now is its economy is so big and by purchasing power parity, China now has the largest economy in the world. It's, purchase, you know, it's so big that it only needs a 1% or 2% rate of growth to create 10 million jobs. And actually, somebody then kind of said, well, if you look backwards, it turns out that you know, last year, the new uh, demand that was created 
by a low rate of growth was something like 1.2 trillion new dollars. And that 1.2 trillion was three times as much as what was created by a 12% rate of return 20 years before. And then you think about this and say, well, actually, isn't it more important to look at the mass rather than the rate? And that actually is how political power is exercised. I mean, the Koch brothers and the Waltons and all the rest of it don't dominate politically and economically in the way they do because they have a high rate of growth. No, they dominate where they are because they've got such a huge mass of asset values behind them. And that therefore the mass is absolutely crucial. So I wanted them to say, well, we should be talking not about rates, but talk about masses. But here I had a problem with my Marxist friends, because my Marxist friends love to talk about the falling rate of profit in volume three of Capital. And the argument is that the increasing the social productivity of labor actually leads to a falling rate of profit. Well, it's a neat argument, and Marx made it. But actually, if you go to the text, of his, the original text of his, uh, of his argument, yes, there's a falling rate of profit. But then it turns out it's not only a falling rate of profit, there's also a rising mass. And, and, and I go to all my sort of you know, economist fr Marxist friends and say, well, you've given me all these graphs of the falling rates of profit around the world. Where are your graphs on the rising mass? Nowhere to be seen. Yet the rising mass is crucially important for understanding all sorts of relations which exist. Let me give you just one example. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to... Oh, that one, okay. This is a graph of cement consumption. The blue line at the bottom is the amount of cement that has been produced and utilized in the United States over 100 years. The red bar is the consumption of cement in China. Now, tell me rate and mass doesn't matter. <laughs> now, there's something interesting about this graph. You can't see any cessation in the consumption of cement in 2007, 2008. In fact, in 2007, 2008, it jumps up hugely. China was in difficulty in 2007, 2008 because the US consum uh, consumption market had cr crashed. And it needed to do something to employ 10 million people a year. In fact, in 2007, 2008, the export industries in China seem to have lost something like 300, you know, something like 30 million jobs. 30 million, pretty much in one year. At the end of the year, I, the IMF went in and did a kind of a real detailed study and said, well, actually, the net job loss in China was only 3 million. So China created 27 million jobs in one year. What were all those jobs about? Well, internal consumption is not that great. So you went into something which Marx calls productive consumption, that is investment in infrastructures. China started to build urbanization like crazy and infrastructures like crazy. In 2008, China had zero miles of high-speed rail network. It's now got 20,000 uh, 20, miles, 10 years or so. It's an astonishing performance. And of course, as you know, a high-speed rail network takes a lot of cement. So actually, the ch China actually saved global capitalism. 30% of the growth that's occurred in capitalism since 2007, 2008 has been due to what happened in China alone. And that is more than North America, Europe, and Japan combined. In other words, if you said, who saved global capitalism? It was the Chinese. Now, do you think the Chinese Communist Party sat around and said, oh, how can we save these poor capitalists? No, the answer is no, 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 but it, they did it because they were dead scared about unemployment. 
Massive unemployment. 30 million people unemployed in China? Boy, there's going to be trouble. And they knew it, and so they've got to put everybody back to work, which is why that latest example of saying, well, we need to create 10 million jobs. Turns out, actually, they need to create 20 million jobs. They've been creating about 20 million jobs a year since 2000. I mean, this is an economy that's going berserk. And, of course, we know what some of the environmental consequences are. Anybody who knows anything about cement knows it's a great producer of greenhouse gases. It's an appalling uh, environmental consequences in terms of its production. And in terms of its consumption, it's hardly good and friendly to you know, all the species that are, that are currently threatened and all the rest of it. But that was a saving of capitalism. And the thing that was that whole system I was telling you about didn't revive because of quantitative easing little bit round the margin. It really got survived, it really survived by the fact that it managed to expand through the Chinese because, and here too, this is where this whole kind of thing that actually the falling rate of profit argument, Marx says, is really a falling rate of profit increasing mass of profit argument. And that the same process, he says in, that, in, in, in his notes, the same process that produces a falling rate of profit produces a rising mass. Why? Because if, if, if I have an automobile factory and I'm producing with 100 laborers 10 cars a year and suddenly there's an enormous increase in, in, in productivity and I can produce 1,000 cars a year, then there's a huge demand on means of production, a huge demand upon iron and steel and rubber and all the rest of it. At the same time, it's not only a huge demand which is going to be uh, going to expanded, but at the same time, I've got to find somebody who's going to buy the 1,000 cars a year. And by the way, if they're going to buy a 1,000 cars a year, they need a roads to drive on. So, so, so you start to... So, so what Marx does in that chapter is to say, it's not the falling rate of profit. It's, it's about the falling rate of profit and the, right, and, and the ever-increasing mass. Now, part of the problem with economic theory right now is it just talks about rates all the time. And it doesn't take into account that the rising mass is of great significance in terms of the nature of the problems that we have. The reason this graph on cement is so important is because yeah, the United States consumed a lot of cement at a certain point of its history, particularly in the creation of the interstate highway system in the 1950s and 1960s. And there was a lot of concrete being spread around. I mean, you know, you see results of it here in Puerto Rico. You see it everywhere. A huge kind of uh, develop, urbanization development, and, and that, that there's a connection between keeping that circuit going and actually creation of a second nature of a certain sort. And the trouble with Chinese urbanization is it's a kind of an environmental disaster. Life expectancy north of the Yangtze has been cut significantly over the past few years because of the huge problems of air pollution. And when you go to live in any Chinese city and you're there for a while, you're lucky if you see anything. The only, uh, although that is not quite true. Because the one time, the, f well, the second time I went to Beijing, I arrived and it was a beautiful blue sky. Everything was, was incredible. I thought, why is all this nonsense about Beijing being the center of uh, atmospheric pollution? Well, it turned out that, that that weekend was a weekend where something like 40 or 80 foreign leaders were being invited to Beijing to a big conference on the Belt and Road project. And in order to get the optics right, the Chinese had closed down all the factories, banned all the cars for about the previous two weeks, and so you had a very beautiful blue sky. So my advice to you, if you're going to Beijing, find a time when there's a good conference on and they're going to do that, and then, you're, then you'll be okay, and you'll come, a, you'll come away with a great kind of feeling about how great, great this place is. Uh, and, and actually, the other thing was, the amazing thing was that all of the highways had roses growing. I didn't understand where this is coming from. I mean, it's kind of... Uh, China is an astonishing uh, uh, place uh, to be. But, but 
my, 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 my point here is, is that we are living in, I, I think, a, a really, really radically different world where the questions of the mass are becoming far, far more important and compelling. One of the ways in which I had been looking at the history of urbanization in relation to, to capital accumulation was that I had three case studies that I was looking at. One was Second Empire Paris. After the crash of 1848, Louis Bonaparte came to power. What a terrible mess, lots of unemployment, this kind of thing. How is he going to get out of it? Well, he brought Haussmann to Paris and he said to Haussmann, rebuild Paris, put everybody back into full employment and this kind of thing, and they rebuilt Paris like crazy. It was a debt-financed kind of a thing, uh, incredible, and you still go to Paris and you see a lot of the things they did uh, during the Second Empire. And it was a complete reorganization of urbanization. It turned Paris into the city of light. It was an entertainment center, you know, the boulevards, the, the, you know, the whole cultural stuff. I mean, it's a wonderful kind of case study of how you transform urbanization in order to stabilize capital. And it worked up till 1867, when, as usually happened, the debt financing overreached, and then somebody kind of said, you yeah, know, where's the where's the real value in all of this, and, and the whole thing crashed in a financial, in a financial disaster. Uh, that then led to mass unemployment, and then that led to the Paris Commune, and da-da-da-da-da, and of course, in the middle of it, Louis Bonaparte decided the best way to deal with this financial disaster was to go to war with Germany, which wasn't a good idea, and, and he ended up running away to London, and the whole thing, so anyway. But the point here is that all that urbanization that went on in Paris, was, was, was a, at that time a massive reorganization of resources and labor and all the rest of it that tried to stabilize the, the system and, 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 and build accumulation and, that's, it, and it did a very good job of it for, for 15 to 16 years. The second example is what happened after World War II in the United States. Uh, in, in World War II, the, 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 the productive capacity of the United States was up, because of the war effort, leaps and bounds. The big question was, what's going to happen to all that productive capacity? Do you go back into the slump of the 1930s? If you did that and you had all these people coming back from war who knew how to fire guns, you'd have a revolution on your hands. And, and everybody knew that. And so the question was how to rebuild the U.S. economy. In steps Robert Moses, in steps, you know, okay, we'll reconfigure the whole uh, configuration of uh, uh, the New York metropolitan region and the Los Angeles metropolitan region, and we'll automobilize everything, and we'll try, you know. So, you know, this was a, a huge reorganization of urbanization, much, much bigger than the Paris. Paris was about, you know, what went on in the city. Moses was about what went on in the whole metropolitan region. My third example is, is contemporary China, where it's no longer the metropolitan region, it's the whole damn country. And they are now talking about building kind of city complexes, which, which will actually house uh, something like uh, 200 million people in just one complex. In other words, you take the whole, the whole population of uh, Britain, France, and Germany, and you stick it in one, in one urbanization complex. And, 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 and in order, to, you know, so, 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 the, so this is what, what, what is happening. But now, the, the reason this cement thing is so important is because in order to do that, this is the kind of thing you have to do. And, of course, when China set out on this big urbanization project, what did it do? It demanded like crazy that there be all sorts of raw materials available. So if you were a raw material producer in 2008, you are suddenly looking at this huge demand coming out of China for iron ore, for copper, and suddenly you get this, this whole kind of thing. So I've got, you can, okay, okay, look at this in terms of world steel production. How much, you know, where's all the iron ore coming from? When, when, you, when you're in, in, you know, the same thing applies. Uh, let's see. This is uh, copper production. Again, what you notice is the spiral form, the compounding effects. And what, what was interesting to me was that during some of this time I was doing work in Ecuador. Ecuador is rich in mineral resources. Ecuador 
borrowed money from China. Ecuador had a problem paying it back because the oil price collapsed. Uh, so what did Ecuador do? Basically give over all its mineral resources to the Chinese to mine. Where were these mineral resources? Well, they happened to be in indigenous areas. If the indigenous got in the way, get them out of the way, the Chinese turned to the Ecuadorian government, which was supposed to be multi-plural and all the rest of it, and be very nice towards the indigenous populations. And basically the Chinese government said, get those people out of the way. So the, 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 the Ecuadorian military went round and sort of wiped out the indigenous populations to let the... I mean, this is the sort of thing that's going on. And that, in a country that is reasonable, you know, was at least reasonable in some ways in some of its attitudes towards, uh, towards indigenous populations and, and all the rest of it. But the, the economic necessity and the economic inevitability was there. And, and, there was, and so we, what we find is that other countries like Chile, who, you know, providing the copper, Australia providing all kinds of stuff. So if you look at who got hit by the crisis of 2007 and 2008, and who came out of the crisis very quickly, a lot of Latin America came out of it very quickly because they were growing soybeans and they were growing, you know, and they, were, they had iron ore resources and they had copper resources and they had... Uh, they had hides and they had, you know, so, so, so Latin America did, did, came out fairly fast compared to some other parts of the world. And, and this, this uh, again, when Marx kind of says that we're not only dealing with a falling rate of profit, we're dealing with a rising mass, then what Marx kind of says is the rising mass is at some point or other going to hit barriers of accumulation because you're going to have then have a realization crisis of certain kind. And the realization crisis comes when you start to build, as the Chinese have done, huge urban areas and urban sprawl, huge kind of things. And the result is that China, you know, used to see all those pictures in China, people you know, riding their bicycles around. Now you fear for your life, absolutely fear for your life on these bicycles. You would, uh, so everybody's now stuck in traffic jams in China, like everywhere else with appalling air quality. So these are, the, these are, if you like, some of the dynamics which are going on. And what I want, I think, to, for us to think about is to think about the dynamics of that whole system and then think not simply about the rate of change that's going on, because that's important, but think about the importance of this transformation in the mass. Because the mass is, it seems to me, to be really critical right now for environmental questions, uh, for ex uh, extractivism questions and all of the many other questions are now boiled around the fact that it's not only a falling rate of profit we're dealing with, but we're also dealing with a rising mass of profit. And that rising mass has got to a point where it cannot possibly continue at a compound rate and that therefore there has to be some alternative which is going to be built out of an anti-capitalist movement which is going to be located everywhere around that map that I gave you. Okay, thank you. Muy bien, thank you very much. Gracias. Eh, ahora vamos a pasar con el doctor Gustavo García, pero antes quería anunciarles que van a haber diferentes personas pasando tarjetas para escribir sus preguntas, uh, que es la sección que vamos a tener después que García termine. ¿Está bien? Ah, bueno, y si usted tiene papel y las quiere pasar también, claro. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos y todas. Eh, gracias, eh, gracias por esta invitación eh, a la escuela y al colectivo Junte Gente también. Por, yo soy parte de Junte Gente, pero pues fue una invitación colectiva que me hicieron para estar aquí. Es un honor. Gracias a David por estar aquí con nosotros, por su solidaridad, por todo el tiempo que ha dedicado, por los buenos ratos que hemos pasado y por esta presentación que creo que eh, resume, ¿verdad?, desde la perspectiva eh, ecológica para mí, como, ¿verdad?, un pensador y eh, actor en temas ecológicos, resume algunos de los grandes retos que enfrentamos a nivel global y en Puerto Rico eh, al confrontar el tema del capitalismo y la circulación y acumulación de capital. Así que yo creo que, en términos, me voy a enfocar brevemente en cómo en Puerto Rico se manifiesta, en el microcosmos de Puerto Rico, en mi opinión, se manifiestan estos retos eh, que David ha apuntado. 
Y, y es que si, si pensamos en la historia de, de la modernidad en Puerto Rico, eh, el gran proyecto ¿verdad? De, de modernización y de progreso eh, de Puerto Rico en el siglo XX, que fue, por cierto, el origen del capitalismo en Puerto Rico, ¿no? eh, con la llegada de la invasión de Estados Unidos, es una historia de la urbanización. Es una historia de la urbanización como mecanismo principal de circulación y acumulación del capital, eh, tanto para los intereses del capital eh, americano, pero también para los intereses del capital criollo. Si pensamos, por ejemplo, que las primeras urbanizaciones en Puerto Rico fueron construidas por Levitt Homes, una megacorporación que también construyó Levittown, no solo en Puerto Rico, sino en seis o siete otras ciudades en Estados Unidos, bajo precisamente la misma dinámica que explicaba David de la post Segunda Guerra Mundial, donde había que buscar dónde invertir para que esa clase trabajadora que estaba regresando de la guerra no se fuera a una a no, no, no fuera una revolución, había que mantenerlos, ¿verdad? Con su casita, contentos, con eh, un buen trabajo. Ese, ese, esa dinámica se dio en Puerto Rico también. Y antes de eso, ¿verdad? A la, o, o en paralelo a eso, se daba también la dinámica de eh, la expansión industrial en Puerto Rico con las petroquímicas, que no fue otra forma, ¿verdad? De, no, fue, no, era, no, no era sino la forma de las empresas petroleras de Estados Unidos buscar dónde ¿verdad? procesar el petróleo, evitando las nuevas regulaciones ambientales que se estaban desarrollando en los años 60 y 70 en Estados Unidos. Era una forma de buscar dónde podían meter ese capital que ya no lo iban a poder invertir en Estados Unidos eh, porque las nuevas regulaciones prohibían el tipo de quema de petróleo, que se, eh, de procesamiento de petróleo que se, estaba, que se llegó a hacer aquí. Esa dinámica, por supuesto, entonces del, del capitalismo se combina con la relación colonial. O sea que también hay que pensar que en Puerto Rico eh, la, las dinámicas globales del capitalismo se insertan de una forma particular, en una relación colonial de una ocupación militar que no podemos olvidar, ¿verdad? Que como David ha escrito, es una nueva forma, podríamos pensar en un, imperialismo, un nuevo imperialismo en realidad, que se impone por medio de la fuerza militar y del mismo modo que se impuso antes en la colonización a nivel global. Así que ese proceso de, de urbanización de Puerto Rico... Eh, lo podemos ver desde los años, desde los años 50, pero se, se sigue reproduciendo porque, como nos dice eh, David, es un proceso que tiene que continuamente crecer. Tiene que continuamente crecer y por eso en los años 90 vemos, después de, que, de, de, de fase de las 936, ¿verdad? Y vemos un intento de reactivar la construcción como el motor de la economía. Y vemos precisamente ese discurso de que la construcción nos va a salvar que es un discurso que persiste al día de hoy. Así que yo creo que es importante la perspectiva del de, de, de capitalismo y la espacialización del capitalismo que trae David para pensar críticamente esa historia. Porque es el discurso dominante, es un discurso hegemónico del de crecimiento económico basado en la urbanización, en la expansión del área urbana constantemente, sin ningún fin aparente. Por eso el presidente de la Asociación de Constructores de Hogares decía hace unos años que Puerto Rico todavía, todavía ha podido urbanizarse en un 75%. ¿verdad? Y por eso hoy en día los fondos de reconstrucción del CDBG, eh, bla, 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 la cosa esa, ¿verdad? que nadie sabe pronunciar, CDBG Reconstruction, la reconstrucción, ¿verdad? Porque ahora nos van a construir otra vez. Ahora van a expandir nuevamente ese proceso de urbanización. ¿Para qué? Si tenemos más de 200.000 viviendas vacantes en Puerto Rico. ¿Para qué van a construir nueva vivienda? Claro, ¿por qué no? porque eso no es rentable. Eso no es rentable. Yo una vez estaba precisamente conversando con el presidente de la Asociación de Constructores de Hogares como parte de un proyecto de investigación y le pregunté por qué. Porque ustedes no invierten en revitalizar las viviendas, ya, van, ya, ya los espacios abandonados. Eso no es rentable. No es rentable. En parte porque hay todos unos programas federales que promueven la urbanización nueva como mecanismo de, de acumulación. Eso yo creo que es algo que me gustaría también que David elaborar un poco porque hoy en día también se ve la revitalización urbana de espacios abandonados como un mecanismo de acumulación. Entonces, ¿en qué medida la, la expansión urbana nueva versus la revitalización son mecanismos distintos o complementarios? En segundo lugar... 
creo que pues lo otro, lo, lo otro que, que quería plantear, bueno, en esta línea, ¿verdad? Por eso, por eso es que Puerto Rico, hoy en día, tenemos ¿verdad? la mayor concentración de Walgreens y Walmart en el mundo. Y tenemos una de las mayores concentraciones de carreteras. O sea, que podemos ver que Puerto Rico es un microcosmo en donde se, se aplica al extremo esa, ese proceso de urbanización del capital, ¿no? Entonces, eso nos lleva a preguntarnos, ¿verdad? ¿Para quién, para quién y para qué es la ciudad que estamos con, reconstruyendo? ¿Verdad? ¿Es para el capital? ¿Es para la gente? Tenemos hoy en día otro mecanismo importante de acumulación de capital que no es construcción urbana, sino que es la financialización. Quisiera quizás que David también a, a hablar un poco de eso, porque me parece que en Puerto Rico vemos la importancia de ese mecanismo de especulación financiera atado a la ciudad y al, y a, y a, y al espacio urbano como un mecanismo nuevo de acumulación. Eh, y vemos, por ejemplo, en el 2014 ya en el Wall Street Journal eh, se había documentado el número creciente de empresas de inversión de private equity y manejadores de propiedades, que los vemos por ahí con sus letreros verdad en toda, en toda la ciudad, que estaban invirtiendo en Puerto Rico en el mismo momento de la crisis, y para ellos, ellos decían, no, porque aquí no hay ninguna crisis. Aquí no hay ninguna crisis. Eso es algo que David ha, ha enfatizado, que en realidad hay crisis, aparentemente, pero en realidad no hay crisis porque el dinero se sigue moviendo en grandes cantidades. Los chinos, pero también los ricos del mundo siguen moviendo, circulando dinero en grandes cantidades. Hace dos días salía en que Puerto Rico había roto su propio récord de... La, la venta de propiedades de lujo, lo vieron. Eso yo creo que es parte de esa misma dinámica, ¿no? De la financialización del espacio urbano para el de, el, la especulación y el desarrollo de propiedades de lujo como una nueva modalidad de esa acumulación. Entonces, el, el segundo punto que quiero, que quiero hacer es, pues, sobre, obviamente, sobre los límites ecológicos, las contradicciones ecológicas que enfrenta ese capitalismo yo, y, 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 el, y el proceso de circulación y acumulación de capital en particular. Y yo creo que David lo, lo puso bien claro con el ejemplo de China, ¿verdad? Pero, o sea, tenemos que plantearnos que el, el, el proceso de acumulación de capital y circulación de capital es inherentemente antiecológico. Y eso para mí es un gran reto para el movimiento ambiental en Puerto Rico y en el mundo, de plantear eso. En los años 60, ese entendimiento estaba, y por eso el movimiento socialista en Puerto Rico dio grandes batallas ambientales contra la explotación de las minas, contra el superpuerto de Isla de Mona, entre otras cosas. Yo creo que hay que volver a recordar eso hoy en día, como, como nos enseña Harvey, porque la realidad es que no hay forma de continuar esa tasa de crecimiento compuesto con una masa económica que es cada vez más grande. En Puerto Rico eso se materializa de forma bien concreta porque nosotros somos un territorio pequeño. Entonces, la, la la limitación espacial de, 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 del territorio ya de por sí muestra ver bien visiblemente esa, esa limitación. Y yo creo que el caso del cemento es, es, es particularmente ilustrativo, porque ¿de dónde salía el cemento y de dónde sale el cemento para la construcción en Puerto Rico? Pues salió de las dunas que destruyeron de toda la costa norte de la isla, que hoy en día casi no existen esas dunas. Y se están restaurando gracias a la gestión de, de la gente, ¿verdad? La gestión de la gente y se están prote las que quedan se han protegido gracias a la gestión de la gente. Pero si tú vas por todo Loíza, por todo, por Isabela, por Aguadí, tú ves las fotos de esas dunas de antes y lo que queda hoy, pues, te das cuenta de esa extracción que se dio, no nos olvidemos, ¿verdad? Para beneficiar, como dije a Levit, pero también a la Puerto Rico Cement, ¿verdad? De el ex gobernador Luis Aferre y de la familia Ferrer Ángel que se enriquecieron y hoy en día ¿verdad? tienen un gran capital gracias a ese proceso de urbanización del, de la naturaleza y del espacio. ¿no? Entonces, las dunas son una. ¿Y de dónde salen hoy? Ya las dunas están protegidas, pero las, las montañas no están protegidas. Las montañas en Puerto Rico son el espacio de hoy de, de sacar el, de la arena para el cemento. Y esas canteras, ¿hasta cuándo se van a poder explotar para continuar un proceso de urbanización que nos dicen que aparenta ser infinito? Un 75% más de la isla, ¿no? Obviamente también la ubicación física de eso. ¿no? ¿Dónde vamos a ubicar toda esa expansión urbana? Entonces, 
André Wors, ¿verdad? Ya había planteado hace un tiempo que no puede haber un ambientalismo que no sea anticapitalista. Y eso es lo que yo quiero plantear, ¿verdad? Que eh, es la, la conclusión evidente de esto, ¿no? Del mismo modo, podríamos decir, siguiendo la lógica que nos presenta David, que no puede haber un movimiento antirracista que no sea anticapitalista. No puede haber un movimiento LGBTTQ y que no sea anticapitalista. No puede haber un movimiento obrero que no sea anticapitalista. Porque el, sistem el sistema capitalista es el sistema de explotación de todas esas car características y condiciones de la vida. Y básicamente es, es la sobrevivencia en realidad de la sociedad y del planeta y de la, de la humanidad lo que está en juego desde la perspectiva ambiental. Por último, yo creo que hay que decir algo sobre la universidad, ¿verdad? Porque estamos aquí en la universidad, así que voy a, voy a dar un giro ahí. Yo creo que, eh, eh, ¿verdad? David comenzó hablando de la solidaridad con la, con la universidad. Eh, yo creo que la, la, nosotros, la intención de Junte Gente, de pares, eh, y de, tra, de, tra, de, de hacer estos eventos con David, otros eventos como el que hicimos con Naomi Klein y eventos futuros que vamos a continuar haciendo es seguir re reivindicando el espacio de la universidad como un espacio de pensamiento y acción crítica ¿verdad? en contra de todas las estructuras de injusticia y de opresión. Lo voy a dejar ahí. Gracias. Yo creo que ya con eso, con eso termino. Eh, no. O sea, es, es la reivindicación de ese espacio que es inherentemente público, pero que sabemos que no es un espacio perfecto. O sea, que nosotros no estamos luchando por la universidad que hay. Nosotros estamos luchando por la universidad que queremos, la universidad posible, la universidad que necesitamos para transformar nuestra sociedad. Así que yo eh, hago esa, esa, ese planteamiento con una invitación también a que todos, todos los que estamos aquí, los, los que estamos aquí, ¿verdad? Seamos parte de esa lucha que hay que dar por esta universidad y por este país y por el país que queremos. Gracias. We have some questions, David. I don't know if you want to say something about what I said, but... I agree. <laughs> uh, primera. <clears throat> is it possible to create a cultural resistance nowadays that is not, in the same sense, co-opted or otherwise tainted by capital? Or can culturally con, can culture successfully confront capital? We uh, we live in a society which is uh, in which capital, social relations, monetization, commodification, uh, all of them are hegemonic. Uh, it is impossible to imagine uh, any kind of movement that is not to some degree or other tainted by court within uh, or all of that. So I think it would be naive to think that somehow or other we can create an alternative outside of. But it seems to me that the, the big strength of uh, Marx's analysis was to point to certain contradictions, uh, contradictions within capital, uh, which it is open, I think, for people to exploit and to utilize, uh, to try to shift the balance towards some alternative form of reproduction of daily life. At the same time, there are many activities uh, around the world, and I frequently encounter them, uh, as I have here, of 
attempting to create what I would call unalienated spaces outside of the dominant forms of social relations. And I think uh, that testifies very much to the very widespread sense uh, that the kinds of lives we are allowed to live and the kinds of employments we are offered, the kinds of politics uh, which we have are unsatisfactory, uh, are actually alien to who it is we want to be and how we would want to be. So I think that if you took, put those two things together, that there are macroeconomic contradictions uh, which force capital into certain kinds of compromises with itself, but also with the populations. Uh, at the same time with these many efforts that would go on very often in micro spaces within the world economy where something different is imagined, something different is orchestrated and that something different is sometimes given expression through cultural means. Uh, a lot of cultural activities these days are uh, oriented towards the critique of commodification and cultural uh, appropriation. So I think that the situation is that Yes, we, we cannot be outside of monetization and commodification and all the rest of it, but at the same time, we can have one foot somewhere else than in that. And at the same time, and this is, I think, probably one of the main things that I think everybody on the left is preoccupied by, and we have had conversations about it, that we see many social movements and eruptions around the world uh, the difficulty is they don't seem to last. Uh, I remember, for example, uh, February the 15th, 2003. Millions of people in Barcelona, in Madrid, in Rome, in London, went on the streets and said, we do not want war. It was a huge global demonstration. Huge. And you then said to yourself, why did all those people go home? Why didn't they stay on the streets and see something different? But again and again, you see movements erupt quickly and then fade. And I think one of the things that we need to do is to think about ways in which better to pin together uh, these very diverse movements and I think uh, also try to deal with uh, a long history on the left of sectarianism and forming circular firing squads. Uh, so, I mean, the, the questions which face us right now are, are, are too serious, it seems to me, uh, to be really concerned about uh, ideological purity or intellectual purity. I mean, we, none of us really know what we might do right now. But we've got to go out and do something and something has to change and something has to move. Yeah. And we need, that's what we need. And I think that you know, meetings like this and, 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 and more meetings like this uh, are the sorts of forums that can begin to to articulate uh, an alternative politics, even though I have no real concrete proposals of that sort. But I think right now there is uh, a need for something radically different. About this, um, there is a question here about um, the possibility of a radical humanism and uh, what does that mean in, in your conceptual map that you presented, David? Um, well, part, that, that was partly to do with the fact that the concept of uh, alienation uh, 
has uh, had a rather rough history on, on the left, and the tendency is to avoid it. Uh, Marx's notion of alienation in the economic and philosophic manuscripts was a subjective uh, idealist notion of alienation. Uh, he clearly abandoned that uh, later on for an objective uh, theory of alienation, which was really about how the laws of motion of capital operate as abstractions which govern us and that we are not in choice, we are not in control of our own history. And part of the purpose of that theory of alienation was to urge us to grasp control over our own history and to make it uh, consciously according to our own will. I've always thought that the tendency on the left to abandon the subjective notion of alienation was short-sighted, that what was needed was to bring together the subjective and the objective perspectives and that there were ways to do it and that I thought that some of the best thinkers in the leftist tradition and I think of people like uh, Cabral and Fanon and the like uh, had a way of bringing them together and that those were the ways in which we should start to think about uh, a radical revolutionary humanism which is clearly separate from the bourgeois humanism that underpins theories of human rights and the like. So that, uh, that was the real reason for trying to bring up this idea of a, a revolutionary humanism that would actually be based upon an understanding of alienation in, in both its subjective and objective dimensions. Um, I, gu I guess that's, that's very important also in terms of the creation of, of new wants and, uh, and, yes. and new yes. needs now yes. in society uh, as, a, as, a <coughs> as part of the process of capital circulation. Um, there is a question here about the trade war with uh, China and whether you think that might escalate into military confrontation or how do you foresee the future of China <laughs> uh, and, and uh, in the context, let's put it more generally, the future of China in the global context. In this. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I mean, you know, chi China is very dynamic and, and it keeps shifting and changing. I mean, I wrote a chapter about China in A Brief History of Neoliberalism that came out in 2005. And at the time I said, you know, the trouble about writing about China is that as soon as, by the time it gets published, it's out of date. <laughs> And of course it is out of date and I've recently been trying to rewrite that chapter to mm -hmm. contemporary circumstances. Mm -hmm. But I think that, I think that what, what, what is happening in China is something that needs to be taken very, very seriously. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, a, after all, you know, the president of that country spent six years in this cultural revolution living in one of the poorest villages in China he recently went back to that village and declared that one of the big aims of the Communist Party is that people should be everywhere, should be free of poverty. In, 18, in, in, in 1980, according to the World Bank, there were 840 million people in China living under conditions of abject poverty. They now estimate that only about 40 million people are living under conditions of abject poverty that China has actually brought people out of poverty at a rate and at a speed, which is absolutely astonishing. And, and, and uh, there is a commitment at a certain level within the Communist Party to Marxist principles and the like, and I disagree with those people who say this is just, you know, mousing stuff that doesn't matter. I think it does matter. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a seriousness to it. Of course, the Chinese are not very nice about it in the sense that they, they kind of basically say, we can't afford messing around with any of that democracy and human rights nonsense. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and do what we're gonna do and we're gonna do it very fast and, and they have declared they want to be a fully socialist society by the year 2050. 
And they know, and they've said, there are two major problems on the way to that. One is the levels of social inequality, which in China went from almost nothing in 1980 to sort of one of the most unequal countries in the world. And the second is the environmental question and how to, how to deal with the environmental question, and they know that. And their record is that when they decide they want to do something, they do it. And, and, and no holds barred, and, and it's not democratic, it is not. You get in the way of it, you're in real trouble. There's no question. So there are a lot of things that are problematic about the Chinese society, but I do think that what they're doing is, is, has, has to be taken seriously. Mm. I'm personally not convinced that they're too worried about the, the, the tariff war and stuff. Mm. I, I think they actually recognize, as actually quite a few American analysts do, that the tariff war is gonna hurt the United States far more than it <laughs> hurts, uh, hurts China. Mm. And in fact, to the degree that China is trying to shift its economy away from low wage industries to, to uh, the more advanced tech, uh, it plays into their hands. And when the US starts saying, going on and on about you know, them stealing intellectual pop property, well, where did the US steal all of its intellectual property from? <laughs> it took all the Soviet scientists and it took all the German scientists after World War II and stuck them in NASA and all things like that. I mean, I, you know, I mean, this, is, this is kind of, you know, and, and, and by the way, I think the Chinese have got most of what they want out of the United States already. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so they're not really too concerned about you know, future mm -hmm. things. So I, 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 I'm not sure the tariff thing is, is so big. I may be entirely wrong about that. I'm going to use my privilege to ask a follow-up question because uh, you mentioned something in about the, the intersectionality, the relation between different uh, struggles, and, and then you were giving the Chinese example about uh, um, you know, how, they, how they invested in massively in urbanization as a, to, to have employment. And this led me to think about current debates about the reduction of the work hour as, a, as, a strat as an environmental strategy and as a strategy to reduce uh, uh, labor oppression also, uh, labor exploitation, uh, sorry. So uh, what, what do you think about this in terms of what if the Chinese, instead of doing these projects to hire 10 million people, would have said, we're going to reduce the work hour and maintain the, the same salary for everybody to distribute the labor? You know what I mean? Well, the Chinese, the, the, the Chi actually, on the labor question, the Chinese do operate under certain cultural constraints. Uh, for example, uh, the general view is that you shouldn't work after you're 60. And when I go to China, people look at me as if I'm insane. <laughs> you're still work? What? <laughs> and, and actually, it's very, and, and actually, China's running into labor shortages right now because of the one child policy and all the rest of it. So they're running into labor shortages. Wages have gone, started to go up quite fast. They, they've tripled in the, the last five years in southern China. Result is Chinese corporations are offshoring, going to Thailand and Cambodia and Laos and even Bangladesh. Uh, because uh, labor costs are lower. So, so you know. Now, w w behind what the question you're asking is that, that Marx kind of uh, takes a view that the, the, the real signature of a, uh, of a capitalist, of, of a socialist society is, is free time. And the more free time you have, the more important it is. Now, it's, I, this, this gets us to one of the central contradictions of capitalism these days. We have all of these time-saving technologies around, but if you ask people, have you got more free time? The answer is no. And part of it is because they take so much time managing those time-saving technologies. <laughs> And then dealing with a telephone company that won't answer when it, you know, all those kinds of things. So, so yeah, there's something like the, the, the question of uh, temporality in, in China. And, and, of course, the Chinese factories are the centers of, of, of a gross uh, exploitation on the classic I mean, kind of thing Marx and Engels wrote about. You, you, know, you go into a 
you get these descriptions of what's going on inside of uh, Foxconn and Shenzhen and places, and, and, it, and, and it's, appa it's appalling, and the whole history of worker suicides and, 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 and the like. So again, uh, you know, China is not a pretty picture on that, on that, ki on that kind of front. But I think that actually the, the whole kind of question of temporality is, is, really, is really interesting. And, and, but, but capital uh, hates it if people have free time. Because the trouble is if people have free time, they actually start to think. <laughs> and capital doesn't like that. I mean, I, I always remember one of the great examples when, when there was a big strike, the miners' strike in Britain. And I've gone, it was 1972 or three or something like that. I don't know. And um, the power stations didn't have enough uh, reserves of uh, coal, so they had to go on, you know, electricity generation was a real problem. And so uh, what Edward Heath did was to say, well, we have to restrict productive activity, and so we have to go to a three-day week. And they went to a three-day week. They also <laughs> shut off television at 10 o'clock at night which actually led to a very rapid rise in the birth rate later. <laughs> and, and, uh, but then, 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 then it turned, it, what, what was interesting was, uh, uh, in terms of output, uh, the three-day week was producing as much output as happened in the five-day week. And a lot of people started to like having a three-day week. And at that point, Capital got really, really nervous and said to Heath, get back to a five-day week as fast as you can, you know, so that people are, you know, and, and, and that's right. But that then all also comes back to the question of uh, alienation and alienation in, in the labor process and alienation uh, in, 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 in general. So that I think the whole kind of question of time is, is really, really important. And having free time is, is where, where you can really not do anything, and it is, is, is great, but the trouble is we need to organize, and organizing takes time, so unfortunately we have this dilemma, and as I'm fond of saying about, you know, when Henri Lefebvre was asked about the relationship between Marxism and anarchism, and he was asked, why was a Marxist rather than an anarchist? He said, I'm a Marxist, so one day we can all live like anarchists. Soon we will have some free time uh, after this. Uh, there, there is a, a question about a couple of questions about colonialism. How do you see the role of uh, the colonial relation and dependent uh, economies uh, uh, in relation to decreasing rate of growth and the growth of the mass of capital? Um, well, you know, again, I think. Uh, I think it's always important when you're talking about colonialism to ask what was, you know, what, what kind of colonialism we're talking about and, 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 and why. Um, on, on the rates and masses thing, uh, uh, for example, uh, Marx talks about relationship between rates and masses and then kind of says at a certain point that uh, uh, as, as you increase the productivity, then you need to create the market and you need to create a new flow of raw materials. And, and in that passage in Capital, he then says, so that explains what's going on with India. The, what the British did was to destroy the Indian textile clothing industry so that it created this huge market for, Latin, for, for the Lancashire cotton industry to sell its products to India. Uh, so India solved the market problem, but at the same time, India had to sort of come up with enough foreign exchange to pay for all of that, so it was cotton, jute, hemp, and all this kind of stuff, which India was actually producing, so it was, you know, so the, the, the role of the colony in this case was simply it was the market, and it was also the supplier of raw materials. But then it turned out that the raw materials didn't really balance the, the, the cotton trade, so they needed another source of income. So what the British did was to persuade the Indians to start, start to uh, grow opium and sell opium to the Chinese. So you get the opium wars to open up China. Uh, then China pays for the opium with silver, and then the silver came down to India, and then the, Indian, and the silver went back to Britain. So this is the kind of so this is the colonial, in, in this case, colonialism was embedded in a certain kind of uh, set. Now, 
how you how you look at uh, uh, col the colonial relation which you look at here, and I, this is where I think the, the the parallels with Greece are very interesting. I find it a little problematic to say that that Greece is a colony of, of Germany, but in many ways, in terms of its uh, economic flows and all the rest of it, there are similarities between what is happening to Greece and what is happening here. Uh, in, uh, in, in Puerto Rico, that uh, the indebtedness has a lot to do, something I didn't talk about, which is the circulation of interest, bearing capital, looking for ways to you know, uh, uh, screw the world in effect. And of course, a lot of it flowed to, uh, to Greece in a certain period, and then the debt crisis hits, and now the austerity, the austerity, and the austerity. And I uh, have colleagues there who, for three years after they retired, received no retirement income because there was no money in the pension fund uh, and the like. So, the, you know, these sorts of things. So I think it's always important. I, I, I'm a little nervous about some of these categories, like imperialism, like, like uh, colonialism, because it, it, it tends to homogenize. And I would want to be very specific about, all right, what is the nature of the colonial relation and how does it work? Uh, for example, uh, in, here in, in, in Puerto Rico, I think historically, Puerto Rico has always been a very important labor reserve. Uh, and uh, how capital works is to try to find some place that's a labor reserve where the costs of social reproduction are born in that place rather than uh, you know, in the society in general so that when people get sick, they go back and get taken care of back in the place of social reproduction so uh, I think you know, it's anal analyses along these lines. I mean, I'm not saying that. So it's very important to do the analysis of exactly what kind of is the, the economic role and, 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 and that. So as part of the Industrial Reserve Army, I mean, I think particularly uh, in, in, in the, the Second World War and afterwards, Puerto Rican labor, I think, played a very important role as, as part of that Industrial Reserve uh, character. And the role of the Industrial Reserve is, of course, uh, well, to both provide the labor, but also to put pressure on the employed uh, so that they work longer hours and harder and all the rest of it. So the Marx has a very good analysis of that. And uh, as my good friend uh, Jim Blout, who worked a lot with the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, used to say, if you want to understand uh, Puerto Rico, go read Marx on Ireland and the role of the Irish in relationship to Britain. And it's a very, very um, the parallel the stuff there is really very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I'm not saying he was right, but you know, since he was closer to it than me. Uh, so it's very important, I think, always instead of kind of saying, well, it's just colonial, uh, which suggests some sort of, you know, you're administered from somewhere or other. Well, and it's not like that, but exactly how is it? Well, and, and, and so when looking at the details of flows of value, where value is being produced, how it's being appropriated, who's appropriating it, what's the role of a comprador bourgeoisie, you nearly always have a comprador bourgeoisie of some kind who's making a lot of money uh, internally from this, and uh, there's a tendency always, of course, uh, to blame outside powers uh, for actually internal class appropriations. I mean, I have this fight in Latin America all the time. The Brazilians are always going on about the, you know, the, the IMF and the Americans and this kind of stuff. You say, what about your own bourgeoisie? You know, your own bourgeoisie has really kind of been making out like bandits and you're not saying anything about them, you're blaming, you know. So I think there's a lot of discuss, discussion of that kind that needs, needs to be had. Yeah, yeah, we have the Ferrez, the Ponalledas, no, the Carrions of the world. <laughs> are, we, are we naming them in here? <laughs> oh, good. Que no se nos olviden los criminales que causaron esta crisis. I think I think your point is very important about the labor reserve because uh, I think um, uh, your kind of analysis also leads us to consider how that labor reserve is, is historically historically produced through processes of accumulation by dispossession, no? How the dispossession, for instance, of the, of the lands of peasants in Puerto Rico generated the, mm -hmm. the labor, the peasants that were self-subsistent, -subsist and then they, they were created in the same way that the origins yeah. of capitalism yeah. no? Yeah. created the labor reserve in England. And, um, 
So I, I'm going to finish one, one last question. There is a couple of interesting questions here about narco-capitalism and uh, the role of, of drug trafficking, of uh, human trafficking. And um, uh, we have a, a, a big problem uh, in Puerto Rico with, with uh, the drug, drug business and uh, drug, the drug war. So this is a question that I don't know if you want to try to comment on or if Yeah, you, I'm, not, I'm not really in a position to uh, say much uh, about that except to say that one of the things that's really striking about contemporary capitalism, it has a lot to do with the dynamics actually, it's not accidental. Uh, of, of, of how much value now circulates through what might be called uh, illegal, ch illegal channels and illegal activity. Mm. I mean, I was always raised to believe that capital could survive as a, a, a legal system, but it, it seems to me more and more the case that illegality is fundamental and foundational mm. to its uh, perpetuation. Mm. I mean, and not only in the sense that it's uh, unethical, because, you know, we can complain about it being unethical from day one, but that it is actually illegal in terms of its own structures of legality. And I think we're seeing that at all levels. I mean, I think one of the things that is uh, you know, really interesting about uh, the Trump presidency is the, the complete redefinition of uh, legality. Uh, the US has always uh, had this fiction that it's uh, a country of laws uh, not of people, but that is being severely undermined right now. It was always a fiction, but, and, and probably an inaccurate one, but at least uh, people held to it as, uh, but now it's becoming increasingly uh, difficult, I think, to, to hold to that, that fiction. And I think that uh, the whole kind of uh, drug trade, clandestine armaments, movements, uh, human trafficking, these kinds of things, and money laundering and, 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 and so on are now becoming, it seems to me, to be uh, yeah, pretty, pretty basic uh, for how capital is uh, circulating and what it's uh, getting into. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, David, um, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Well, well, thank you, thank you all. everybody, for being here. Gracias. Así es que ahora culmina una jornada de una semana entera de mucho trabajo. Eh, Junte Gente se fajó. En su página eh, van a tener colgado todas las actividades que hubo y las entrevistas con Harvey. Eh, así es que continuaremos en los salones de clases y en la calle. Buenas noches. for instance in Mexico are now completely tied with the mining industry and with the for, uh, avocado production and all these legal businesses but which need like a kind of like a violent structure to kind of displace communities that are resisting so you see all this the murder of environmental activists right right right, right. right. I mean Italy is a, a very good example also these days yeah. I mean there are two governments in Italy There's, if you want something get really get done, you go to the mafia yeah, and yeah, forget yeah. the legal government. I wanted to say hello to you because I, I am a friend of James Blout. Oh, okay. We met at Vancouver. Okay. Maybe you do not remember 